Welcome to the inaugural 2024 Bessie Climate Seminar, <laughs> uh, the first lecture of that seminar and the first instance of the seminar. Um, so we're thrilled to be joined by Brett Christophers, but before I introduce him, a little bit more about what's going on here. So first, Bessie. Bessie is the Berkeley Economy and Society Initiative, Bessie, and it's a new political economy center here at Berkeley. It's one of several such political economy centers around the country, and I believe some around the world, which have been supported by the Hewlett Foundation. Um, Neil can correct me, but I think this is one of, if not the only one, directed by a non-economist, in our case, Paul Pearson. And it is certainly, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, one of, if not the only one at a public university. So I think adding I mean, those together- A non-economist, non but you got most of it. Got most of it, okay. Let's just say Bessie is the best, <laughs> basically for these reasons. Uh, maybe it's not exclusively the best. Um, so Bessie has several streams of work. One of them is political economy of climate change. Uh, that's what we're doing here. Jonas Meckling is directing that work stream, but is at Harvard this year on sabbatical. Um, this seminar is also being co-sponsored by my lab, the Socio-Spatial Climate Collaborative, or SC2. And we are meeting here at the Social Science Matrix, which is a brilliant cross-disciplinary institute here on campus. So huge thanks to Bessie and SC2 and the Matrix for making this happen, and Eva and Chuck and Diana in particular for logistical support. Okay, and then the last thing, this is like a kind of odd format. So essentially, like I just said, we have someone in Sweden, a group here uh, in the matrix, and then folks on Zoom from around the world. And basically the idea here is on the one hand, it's good to meet in person and to rebuild community, especially in the wake of COVID. And we have a climate emergency to which planes contribute. And uh, it is nice to have convenience in life. So I think it's a pretty good time to use these new technologies to have conversations across borders and across spaces uh, and to kind of combine in person and virtual. So that's this kind of hybrid event here. Okay, now onto the topic at hand. Um, we're in an insane moment on planet Earth. We have a climate emergency, which is convulsing everything. And we have the rise of green capitalism, which is transforming the economy in many, many big ways. And these two forces are colliding with ecological break breakdown, of which climate change is one part, and the rise of green capitalism. So the collision of these forces is what we're trying to get a handle on this spring. Um, now, some wonder if green capitalism can even get off the ground. And today, Brett will present his new book on this topic. The subtitle is not very subtle. The price is wrong. Why capitalism won't save the planet. So we'll hear more in a minute. All right, welcome. Um, and then I just want to note, after Brett's talk on April 23rd, we'll hear from Camilla Gramco, who is the interim director of the um, Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean. It's Brasilia office, where she's helping shift economic ideas in Latin America and in Lula's Workers' Party. And then we'll hear from Saleh Omarova from Cornell Law on her highly influential proposals for public finance. So in short, we'll get a pessimistic case on the ability of firms to drive the clean energy transition. Then we'll hear from two leading experts, one in Brazil, one in the US, on different ideas for how the public sector can intervene much more dramatically in the economy. So to kick us off, Brett Christophers is Professor of Human Geography at Uppsala University's Institute for Housing and Urban Research. Christopher is interested in various aspects of Western capitalism today and historically. His recent publications include several books published by Verso, including The New Enclosure, The Appropriation of Public Land in Neoliberal Britain, Rentier Capitalism, Who Owns the Economy and Who Pays for It, and Our Lives and Their Portfolios, Why Asset Managers Own the World, from just last year. And his <laughs> new book, which is coming out today, is The Price is Wrong, Why Capitalism Won't Save the Planet. And in fact, Verso has been so kind as to offer us a special discount code, which we'll send to everybody who attended. So if you would like to buy the book after the stock, you can do so with a discount. Of course, you don't have to. Um, so Brett will talk for 30 to 35 minutes, and then we'll do a Q&A. If you're on Zoom, simply type your question into the chat or into the Q&A bubble. I will be supervising that, and we'll post some of those questions during our Q&A. Okay, now. Uh, I guess I'll start by saying it's, it's a, a pleasure to, to be with you uh, from Uppsala. Uh, where it's quarter past eight in the evening, um, and to be with you on this inaugural occasion, yeah. I hope. Okay, so yes, I'm going to, in the next half an hour or, or 35 minutes or so, um, I'm going to try and give a, um, I guess, an overview. Maybe that's a, a, a bit of a grandiose word for what I'm going to try and do. I'm going to try and at least give a, a, a kind of synopsis, I suppose, of some of the main themes and arguments of the book. Um, 
uh, but it's kind of a it's there's kind of a paradox um, uh, related to the book in the sense that the the central argument of the book is actually a really really simple argument, hopefully not simplistic, but it's a very very simple argument. Um, but the book itself is, is is quite long and complex. So I'm only going to be able to sort of skim it um, in the time available today. Um, uh, but there's obviously a lot more in there, um, which I'm not going to be able to get into. But hopefully when we have some questions at the end, I will be able to get into that. OK, so and I guess the other thing that's worth saying, Daniel mentioned the the subtitle. Um, I, I confess no responsibility for that. Verso likes the subtitle. It comes up with the subtitles and even the titles. Um, so it's a very grandiose title. Uh, and, and certainly I'm not going to be saying um uh, a kind of a wide or sweeping argument for why capitalism can't, can't save the planet. And the very last thing I'm going to do is 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 argue with existing and other arguments about uh, the ways in which capitalism presents uh, an obstacle of various kinds to um, to resolving the climate crisis. I'm simply hoping to add, I guess, one new argument to a set of existing arguments with which I think for the most part it's, uh, it's actually complementary. Anyway, so where I'm going to start with this is by saying that I'm going to be talking about electricity. I'm not going to be talking only about electricity, but I'm going to be talking a lot about electricity. Um, and so what I want to do first of all is say why. And I think for, for some of you uh, who are listening, and perhaps even most of you, it'll be obvious why I'm going to talk about electricity, but I think it's worth spelling out um, some of the main reasons for why it's important to talk about electricity. So um, to start in the most in the most obvious of places, if we think about the various greenhouse gases um, that are responsible for uh, global warming, there's obviously an array of different like greenhouse gases, but something like three quarters of greenhouse gas emissions are represent carbon dioxide. And so if we focus in on on carbon dioxide, and we look at where that carbon dioxide is coming from, again, about seventy five percent of that, is generated by the combustion of fossil fuels, so petroleum, gas, and 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 coal. Um, and so then, if we arrow in again on that seventy five percent, so on the combustion of fossil fuels, the single largest component of that is electricity generation globally. Uh, I think it's somewhere between forty and fifty percent currently is is electricity generation. So that's why we focus um, on electricity. That's why electricity is such an important thing to focus on. But there's actually an even more important reason to focus on electricity, which is that if electricity is important to the climate problem today, electricity is 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 set fair to be even more important to the climate problem going forward. And again, this is going to be obvious uh, probably to most of you, but I think it just bears spelling it out. And the reason for that is that rightly or wrongly, for better or for worse, um, and there's obviously all sorts of arguments around this question, the world has essentially bet the house on electrification as the kind of centrepiece of overall climate mitigation strategies. Uh, so the, the idea there is that you essentially electrify as much as you possibly can, and then at the same time as you as you undertake that electrification, you endeavour to generate that electricity uh, through carbon-free me free means, uh, excuse me, rather than through the combustion of fossil fuels. Um, and, and it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. If you take vehicle transportation as, as an obvious and, and perhaps the best example of that, so currently vehicle transportation runs predominantly on the combustion of, of petroleum through an internal combustion engine, and obviously, there are two main ways in which you could decarbonize that. You could shift to another fuel source, something like ethanol or a biofuel of some kind, or you could switch away from a fuel source altogether to uh, to a battery, and then ch and, and charge that battery through uh, through electricity that is cleanly generated. And and again, for better or for worse, rightly or wrongly, it's the latter strategy that the powers that be around the world have essentially adopted. For the most part. And so the point is that we need to understand electricity and focus on electricity because if electricity is important to greenhouse gas emissions today, it's potentially going to be even more important in the future because the electricity sector is going to be much, much bigger in the future than it is today. And just as one metric to, to try to kind of give flesh to that assertion, 
if you look at the International Energy Agency's uh, so-called net zero by 2050 scenario, it's, uh, I guess, best guess of of the, the, the possible path that we could take to reach uh, net zero within the energy sector by 2050. It estimates that if we follow those strategies that I've been talking about uh, that are electrification led, then the share of electricity in final energy demand globally will go from something like 20% globally today to around 50% by 2050 as we electrify transportation, buildings, heating, uh, various industrial processes and so on. So we've bet the house essentially on electrification. Um, and that's why we need to focus on electricity, which is what I'm doing today. So if that's the case, that raises the first obvious question, which is how are we doing on decarbonizing electricity uh, generation? And, uh, you know, my view on this is that this is the, a classic case of whether your glass is, is half full or half empty. So yeah, for those of you who 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 get the updates from um from sources like Bloomberg Green, you will typically be hearing the first of those perspectives. Very much a glass half full perspective. Renewables is kind of full steam ahead. Total global additions of new renewables capacity last year was 50% up on the year before. Never mind the fact that almost all of that was in China. We won't mention that fact, but um, but 50% growth on the previous year. And so we see this steep upwards curve. So the story is a very positive one. Um, and that's what you'll get from a book like Climate Capitalism by Akshat Rathi at um, uh, Bloomberg, which is actually, funnily enough, also published today, even though it gives kind of the uh, the exact obverse arguments to, to, to the one I'm going to be giving. Uh, so that's that perspective. But the other perspective, which is the glass half empty one, is to say, OK, we know renewables are growing very fast. But solar and wind generation don't contribute to the climate problem. What, what creates the climate problem is the combustion of fossil fuels. So how are we doing on the question of fossil fuel generated electricity? And the sad reality is that that is still increasing. So even in 2023, despite lots of eminent authorities saying the year before and the year before that, that we had peaked or were soon going to peak, both the amount of electricity generated globally through the combustion of fossil fuels, principally gas and coal, and uh, carbon dioxide emissions from that dirty electricity both increased again globally in 2023. So I think anyone who looks at this from a kind of sober perspective would say that it's very, very difficult to argue that we're succeeding while the problem is essentially still getting bigger. It's not like we're only cutting into it too slowly we're not cutting into it at all so renewables growth has has thus far proven to be purely supplemental to rather than substitutive of dirty fossil fuel based uh, electricity generation so we're not winning uh, is the is the reality and again most of you will know that already but i think the details bear spelling out the only other thing i want to say about that point uh, before Kind of moving on to the to the to the, to the substance of the, of the talk is to to mention as as I would as a geographer um, uh, the huge regional variance globally in this question of the degree of success or failure thus far in decarbonizing electricity generation. So there's massive variance uh, in that. Um, there are various countries around the world, like some of my nearest neighbours. Uh, here in Europe, like Norway, for example, and Denmark, where they're actually a very, very long way down the road. Um, it, Norway uh, had a very good head start in the sense that it has a, a large stock of, uh, of hydro capacity, uh, so it didn't have uh, as far to go as many other places. Uh, France obviously started from a very good place if you're thinking about decarbonisation, because about 70% of nuclear, of, of electricity generation there is nuclear. Lots of South America as well, actually, is very far down the road because of huge uh, hydro resources. But there are lots of other countries around the world, including many in Europe, like Germany would be a prime example of this, where there is a very, very long way to go. And you need to uh, you only need to look at countries such as India, where um, about 75 percent of uh, electricity generation is still from coal. 
Um, South Africa, where it's over 90 percent, is still from coal. China's at about 64, 65 percent. Um, so there's massive regional variation around the world in how far down the road of decarbonization of electricity the world has gotten. And I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to come back to that point of regional variation right at the end, because I think it's very, very important for all sorts of different reasons. So that's where I'm going to start. That's why I'm talking about electricity. And that's kind of where we're at. So that's where we're at. What what has been and what continues to be the dominant um, approach, uh, the dominant policy approach globally um, to uh, electricity de decarbonisation. Uh, there's a huge amount that one can and could say about this, but I'm going to focus on just two very, very important aspects of this today, um, primarily because they set the scene, um, excuse me for what I'm going to say and what follows. So the first of those is to say that, again, rightly or wrongly, for better or for worse, the world has essentially, just in the same way that the world has, has bet the house on electrification, the world has essentially or is essentially betting the house uh, in terms of decarbonisation of electricity on solar and wind. And, and what I mean by saying um, that that's not the only alternative, you could, of course, give a greater role to hydro going forward, to one extent or another than than the world is currently doing and more importantly and as and, and as 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 gets widely discussed both in in academic and policy circles you could certainly ascribe a much greater role to nuclear going forward than the world is essentially doing right now and i know that there's been a mini kind of nuclear re renaissance to varying degrees in various parts of the world over the last couple of years for all sorts of different reasons, not least relating to energy uh, security concerns. But the reality is that's a very, very mini nuclear renaissance. And for the most part, the world is 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 you know sticking the chips on solar and wind. So again, I'll, I'll refer here to the IEA net zero by 2050 scenario. And so its best estimates are that if you look at the proportion of global electricity generation from different uh, sources going out to 2050, that hydro's share of global generation will go from about 15% where it is today to probably around 12, 13% by mid-century, which means modest increase in absolute terms, but, but, but at the same time, a little bit of decline in, in relative terms. And nuclear, they think, will remain almost exactly where it is today which is at about nine to ten percent of global electricity generation so you'll get you'll get absolute growth for sure but not relative growth so all the relative growth and all the substitution uh of uh unabated fossil fuels will be from solar and, and wind which will go from something like um i think it's at about i can't remember the specific figures around 12 13 percent today up to in the order of 67% by mid-century. So solar and wind is where it's at. And that's why today, and indeed in the, in the book, I focus exclusively on solar and wind and not on nuclear and hydro, not because I necessarily think solar and wind are the answer, but because the world has essentially decided that solar and wind are the answer. And I think they are pretty much the answer, but that's not why I focus on them. So that's the first thing. So solar and wind are the focus. The second thing to say, and this is equally, if not more important, is that for the most part, and and there are certainly regional exceptions to this, of which China is, is for sure the most important uh, and obvious example. But for the most part, what governments around the world have, have essentially done policy-wise is said to the private sector, it's up to you. We are expecting you, the private sector, to take the lead in decarbonizing uh, electricity generation globally. Now, that does not mean that governments don't do anything. Governments do lots and lots of different things. They regulate the uh, markets through which electricity is bought and sold, for example. More importantly still, they have historically put in place and they continue to put in place all sorts of different um incentive mechanisms not least subsidies of various kinds to try to nudge the private sector towards undertaking that task 
at a faster rate than they might otherwise be willing or prepared to do. But what governments, for the most part, are not doing, obviously, is undertaking that investment, uh, their financing, and the ownership and operation of those renewables facilities themselves. They are they have, as I said, they've said they've essentially outsourced it to the private sector and said to the private sector, we are expecting you to do that. Now, if you if you if you doubt the um um the ubiquity of that strategy, uh, you only need to look at uh, figures produced by the OECD or the IEA, the International Energy Agency, or any others. Uh, the last time I looked, if you look over the say the last five years or so, um the vast majority of new renewables investment um, globally has been um, uh, privately owned and privately financed investment. Um, something like uh, 95% of it in uh, the world's richer countries. So it's overwhelmingly private sector led. And interestingly enough, that contrasts very strongly with the fossil fuel economy of the of, of the world which actually is still very very substantially uh, state owned and led and interestingly enough that 95% is the exact opposite of what it is in china so in china um around about 95% of the wind and solar development sector is in the hands of uh, state owned companies uh, rather than private sector companies so it's the exact obverse of, of what is going on uh, elsewhere in the world so Solar and wind and, and private sector. So that's the dominant policy approach. And, and of course, there's lots more to be said about that, but that's um, that's the basic story. So with all of that said, why, if it is the case, which I've argued and which I uh, and, and which I, um, I, I, I I absolutely insist on, if, if it's the case that we're not winning, why are we not winning? Why is that approach not working? So the most common answer you read today um across the board actually i would say both on both on the left and on the right from all, from all different um from all different persuasions is that is that essentially the reasons why we're not winning on electricity decarbonization represent a mixture of obstacles that belong in the realm of politics and planning for want of two better descriptors so there's a there's there's obviously a considerable amount of political op opposition to decarbonisation that is directly or indirectly funded to one extent or another by obstructionist fossil fuel interests. But there's also a huge amount of obstacles in the planning realm. So you can read in any particular week or month, you can read reams of article around the world about the fact that the decarbonisation is being held up by obstacles to getting rapid connections to the grid, obstacles to getting faster permits uh, to to acquire land or uh, to develop, uh, you know, to put to put up turbines or whatever else it might be. Um, uh, there's there's opposition in the form of kind of NIMBY type opposition to people having wind developments in in their in their metaphorical uh, in their proverbial backyard. Um, and so there's a, the, the basic argument is that you have a, a, this agglomeration of factors in the realms of politics and planning. And but what we don't have, um, the argument says, is that what we don't have is a is a fundamental economic obstacle anymore. And so the argument there is that we used to have uh, an economic uh, obstacle, but that that economic that the fundamental economic um hurdle in the way of decarbonizing electricity had a, has essentially been sold. And so now that we've sold the economics, all that stand in our way are these political and planning type reasons. And if we can deal with them, then everything's sorted out and, and decarbonization will proceed apace. All we need to do is get rid of those kind of uh, bureaucratic type uh, obstacles. And the argument there, that that, that that economic argument is an argument that... Um, Again, you hear from both from from very much from both the left and right. And it's essentially an argument about about cost or an argument about cost price uh, more more technically. And the argument there is that if you go back 10, 15 years or so, um, the key economic obstacle to the development of, of solar and wind resources was simply that they were very, very expensive. So the technologies were immature. Um, it cost in relative terms, much, much more over the lifetime of, say, a solar farm 
to generate on average one kilowatt or megawatt hour of electricity than it did by burning gas or coal in a conventional power plant. That's the so-called levelized cost of, ele of electricity or energy metric. And the argument was always that what look what we need to do is invest in these technologies, scale them up, develop them better through competition and critical mass and so on. And then and in doing that, we will bring down the cost of those technologies to a point where they are no more expensive and potentially less expensive on a per per unit um, of production basis than fossil based technologies. And that's the economics dealt with. Um, and that cost story is, is, is ubiquitous, I would argue. You hear it from everywhere. And the basic argument there is that the economics have been solved because costs have come down. And if you go into the into the Internet and you Google LCOE for coal and and renewables, you can find any number of different authorities that will show these charts with the, the prices of solar and wind coming down, which they have. Um, so what my argument is in this book is essentially that actually, no, economics is still a huge problem, despite those cost uh, reductions, which are very, very real. I'm not denying that those cost reductions have occurred. So what's the basis of that argument? Why, like, why am I making that argument? Um, and I want to talk, spend the rest of my time principally talking about that. So the first thing to say um, is that essentially what I argue is that, is that this is an issue of profitability, um, which, of course, if your strategy is based upon reliance upon the private sector, which in a capitalist society is led by profit imperatives above all, above, above all else, that's a problem. If profitability is not an attractive prospect, um, for the private sector, then um, the private, then relying on the private sector to do that very thing is not necessarily a very smart uh, strategy to be uh, pursuing. But that's essentially what we're doing today. So this is about profitability, and it's about profitability in two main and connected senses. And this is where I'm going to be kind of glossing over a lot of complexity in the book. But hopefully, I'm going to do justice in what follows to the argument. So the first thing is that profitability in the business of electricity generation. And it's important to be clear about what I'm talking about here. I am not talking about manufacturing turbines or manufacturing solar cells or modules. I'm talking about the business of developing and then owning and operating solar and wind facilities and selling the electricity that they generate over their lifetime, which will typically be somewhere between 20 and 25 years in the case of a solar or wind a facility. Profitability in that business is incredibly volatile, all other things being equal. And there's a very, very simple reason for that, which is that electricity prices in the markets where electricity is principally sold around the world today, which increasingly is uh, what are referred to as wholesale spot markets, um, which is where generators sell their electricity and suppliers or retailers of electricity buy that electricity price the price of electricity in those markets is incredibly volatile if anyone tells you that they can predict the price of electricity in a spot market three days ahead let alone three weeks months or years ahead they are lying it's incredibly volatile it's incredibly difficult to predict and because pricing is very is very unpredictable and volatile revenues and therefore profitability are also very, very volatile. So what does that mean for solar and wind developers? Now, put yourselves in the shoes for one second of a, a company, an entrepreneur, for example, who wants to um, who wants to build a new wind farm, uh, say in your wonderful state of California, and they go to their local bank and say, hey, miss, hey, Mrs. Mrs. or Mr. Banker, I want to borrow the 200 million dollars that it's going to that it's going to need for me to install these 100 megawatts or 200 megawatts of wind turbines and the banker says okay that's a good idea i like doing i love doing green capitalist stuff that all sounds great thanks for coming and talking to me um if i lend you that 200 million dollars how are you going to pay it back and you will say well once I've got the wind farm up and running, I'm going to sell the electricity that the wind farm generates. And the wind farm is going to be in existence at least 20 years, hopefully 25 years. And then I can replace, replace a few turbines and so on. And the bank will say, OK, well, that's all well and good. 
but what price are you going to sell the electricity for? And that's when you turn back to them and say, well, I don't really know. Here are some charts that show recent electricity prices over the last day or month or year in the Calif in the Californian spot market. And there is, a, there is, as I understand it, one wholesale market specifically for the California region. And the banker will say, you must be mad. Look at that chart. The price goes up and down like that. Is there any way you have have of reassuring me that the price of electricity over the next 15 years is going to be on average above the level which may be say 50 megawatts per um 50 megawatts uh sorry 50 dollars per megawatt hour that is necessary for you to be able to repay that loan and the interest accruing on that loan at that period and you can't do that now I can come back to that later if we want. And what that means in practice is that the industry is entirely dependent upon various different mechanisms for stabilizing pricing at the stabilizing prices at which electricity is sold. And that can either happen through kind of financial hedging agreements, which could be swap or forward agreements. It can happen through long term power purchase agreements with corporate purchase in particular the likes of amazon and google have become very very important uh, in that market or through power purchase agreements uh, with state owned or state backed uh, utilities but um uh, and in and in the european case but not notably in the us case there are all sorts of government um mechanisms for stabilizing those uh, prices as well but other all other things being equal it's profitability is very very volatile and that has a chilling effect on investment in the sector. So that's the first thing. The second thing, and more importantly still, is that whatever the volatility, the reality is that over the long over the long haul and across geographies, profitability in that sector that I'm talking about, the renewable sector, is actually pretty low. And if I had to say in kind of one sentence, the main gist of my book, it's that electricity renewables is actually not a very good business in capitalist terms it's simply not a very profitable profitable business now that does not mean that in particular times in places it has not been or could not be very profitable absolutely it has been in particular times in particular places but in general over the long haul and on average profitability is low returns are on average in the region of say 5 to 8% which when you can put money in treasuries, as you currently can, at 6%, why go to the bother of putting it in the in the risky business of renewables if you're only going to get roughly the same amount? So profitability is low. So a lot of the book goes into explaining why that tends to be the case, and in particular, into explaining something which which kind of seems counterintuitive, right? Which is that if the cost of the underlying technologies have come down so much which they have then why haven't profits gone up why is that business not commensurately more profitable to the extent that the cost of generating the power has come down and i'm going to touch on just two or three different reasons that that is the case um, um in in the few minutes that follow so i'm going to talk about i'll talk about three actually so the first of those um comes down essentially to the question of competition. So um, um, generators, so um, I'm not just wondering how much to say about, about this, um, because again, it might raise, raise an, extra, an extra layer of complexity that I don't want to get into. But for the most part today, in it, it, it basically in liberalized electricity markets around the world, the generation sector of the electricity supply chain is largely separate from the other parts of the supply chain, by which I mean transmission, distribution, essentially the grid, um, and retail of electricity. And I'm and I know that in different parts of America, that's only to some extent the case. There are parts of America which are entirely un deregulated where you still have local vertically integrated monopolies, but something like two-thirds of the American population lives in in deregulated areas where the generation of sector is essentially sector separate and the key point to note about the electricity generation sector and in particular in particular renewables electricity generation it is is that it's an incredibly competitive sector there are very very few barriers to entry 
to that sector. And what that means is that at times when it appears like profitability might be relatively attractive, kind of like now in the wake of the Inflation, Redu Inflation Reduction Act, capital floods in and there are very few barriers to entry to stop that capital flooding in. And that has the effect of, of depressing returns. And now, uh, and so essentially what I'm saying here is that there is very, very little market power in electricity generation. There is no OPEC in electricity in electricity generation is probably the best way of putting it. OPEC is nothing if not a uh, price fixing cartel that is there in large part to sustain the profits of global um, oil and gas companies. There's nothing like that in electricity. And so if the cost of generation come down in, for example, in the renewables area, it's very, very difficult for generators to capture the upside of those cost reductions because competition, you know, go back to Marx's classic phrase, the coercive law of, of competition, those, those uh, generators are essentially coerced through the, through the power of competition, which obviously doesn't apply in all sectors of the economy, into passing on those uh, uh, enhanced cost reductions down the supply chain to other parts of the supply chain and ultimately even to consumers. Of course, not all the cost reductions get passed on to consumers, but significant amounts of them do, though, do so. And that's encouraged by policymakers, of course. One of the reasons they... Um, design electricity markets in the way they do is precisely to enable those cost reductions to be passed on. So that's the first thing to say about profitability is that the structure of the sector, the lack of uh, market power, the competitive intensity sees those cost reductions passed down the supply chain rather than captured in the form of generator profitability. So that's the first one. The second thing to say um, is that um, Electricity is not just electricity. So what I mean by that is that uh, you would often hear people say, you know, an electron is just an electron is just an electron. So that the electricity produced by, say, a gas fired power plant on the one hand and a solar facility on the other is exactly the same. It's just electricity. And yes, it is. Ha however, the electricity produced by different types of electricity generator um, typically possess very different degrees of marketability and very different quantums of revenue potential. Um, and so let me just explain why that is, or the main reason why that is, and, and what the implications of that are. So imagine for one second that you that there is a, a gas-fired plant and a solar farm. And imagine that those two facilities have exactly the same cost of generation, so over their lifetime, it costs them on average exactly the same amount to generate the electricity they produce. And imagine that over a particular time period, whether that's a day, a week, a month or a year, they generate exactly the same amounts of electricity and are able to sell exactly the same amounts of electricity. And, and B does not necessarily follow from A, but let's assume that in this case that it does. You would imagine if they have the same costs and they produce exactly the same amounts of electricity over exactly the same time periods, then they generate exactly the same revenues and profits. But the reality is that's not true. And the reason, of course, is that they will produce that electricity typically at very, very different times of the day, week, month or year. And if you go back to my earlier point about the volatility of electricity pricing, what's very, very significant is that the price of electricity varies significantly at different times of the day, week, month, or year. It's obviously much more expensive in the evening when everyone gets home and put, puts on their kettle for a cup of tea um, or, or for dinner and puts on, puts on the telly than it is in other parts of the day. And so what you find is that certain types of electricity generator tend on average to produce electrical power at times when it is disproportionately valuable, expensive, while others, typically solar and wind farms, tend to produce their electricity at times of the day, week uh, or year when it is disproportionately not expensive. And so just because you have the same amount of electricity and the same cost does not mean you have the same revenue and profits. It depends on the relative value to the market of the electricity that is being generated. And on average, solar and wind facilities produce low value power on the whole. So that's the second thing. 
The third thing, and and the one that I like talking about most because because I'm a geographer and this is a classic geographical point, is that generating costs, so the cost of producing the electrical power might be cheaper in the case of a solar or wind farm today than it is for a conventional power plant. But generating costs are not the only costs that generators incur. So when you at home or when a company that operates an industrial facility gets your electricity bill, that electricity bill obviously is made up of two main components. It's made up of the generating cost, but it's also made up of the cost of that of electricity being distributed from where it is produced to where you and others are consuming. And actually, if you look at the economics of it, that delivery component, the transportation component, is increasingly the main part of the cost as the transmission grid gets increasingly strained and as the cost of generation increasingly coming down, thanks to thanks in part to renewables, the transportation element is becoming the more important element. Now, if you look anywhere in the world, either at a national scale or at a sub national territorial level there is one feature of of the geography of renewables which is which you see repeated everywhere i've ever looked you see it in china you see it here in sweden where i live i live you see it in the uk you see it in texas within texas you see it at the us scale as a whole uh you see it in germany you see it in india you see it in china which is that um as a rule of thumb renewables facilities are disproportionately located where people don't live. So in China, for example, the bulk of the population lives in the south and east and the bulk of the solar and wind farms are in the north and the west. And there's a very, very good reason for that. It's not necessarily because there are better geophysical conditions for generating wind and solar power in those regions. It's that the one thing that solar and wind facilities need the most of, at least if they're onshore, is land. Right. These are very, very land intensive um, businesses, unlike conventional power plants, I hasten to add. And so the main cost or one of the main costs, as well as the technology cost for any um, uh, renewables developer is the cost of purchasing or leasing that land. Now, if you're in a place like the US, where in, say, Wyoming, the cost of land per acre is about one percent in Wyoming of what it is in New Jersey, then of course, if you have the choice, you are going to locate your wind or solar farm in Wyoming, where there's a very, very, very low density of population than you are in New Jersey. Now, what? Why does that matter? But the reason that matter that matters is that the the entities that regulate um, electricity systems um, do their level best to require electricity generation companies to bear the cost of their locational decisions, by which I mean that if if you are a wind developer that uh, decides to set up your facility as far away as possible from where demand is principally concentrated, you will re be required to pay for that decision in terms of transmission costs. Now, it doesn't work perfectly. In fact, nowhere in the world, I would argue, are developers required to bear the full cost of their locational decisions because they're still locating in exactly those um in in exactly those remote places which suggests to me that they're not being required to fully bear those costs but they are required to bear a significant component of them so actually if we go back to that point about generating costs one of the reasons why generating costs are so low in the case of solar and wind is that they are artificially low they're low precisely because transmission and distribution costs are disproportionately high so if you look at the all-in cost of solar and wind power it's not in most cases remotely as cheap or cheaper than fossil generated power conventional power plants are typically located much much closer um, to centers of uh, of center demand the renewables facilities are um, so, again, if you're looking at the profitability question, you need to think far beyond generating costs, which is the metric that everybody focuses on when they discuss these things. Those LCOE numbers do not factor in distribution costs, cost of connecting to the grid or anything else like that. It's the pure 
generating costs. So those are three of the main reasons, I would argue, why the profitability of solar and wind is actually not particularly impressive. And that, again, like the volatility issue, that has a an otherwise chilling effect. So I'm going to go for about another five minutes. I know I've uh, I, I've talked uh, quite a lot here, but I do want to just say a couple more things. So if it is, if I'm right that this is a problem, how do those that recognize this problem, which I think people do in many cases, but they tend to do it in, to recognize it implicitly, sorry, rather than explicitly, how might we resolve that problem? How might we overcome the problem that profitability presents to the renewables investment imperative? There are three main answers to that. And unsurprisingly, they are associated with three different, I guess, interest groups. So the first answer, which is the answer you hear from mainstream or orthodox energy economists, is that it's a question of market design. So, so they would argue, and ha in fact, for many years have argued, that the problem is not that electricity in general and renewables in particular is in the hands of the private sector. The problem is that we haven't got the market design right. The problem is that we are still living in a world of electricity markets that were designed in and for a fossil fuel world, and that we haven't updated those markets to, to, to factor in the nature of the new generating resources that are increasingly coming onto the grid. Is that a fair argument? I guess to a certain extent. Um, but I would also say two other things. First is that all of the different recommendations that those energy economists ca have come up with for different ways of structuring the market are flawed in one way or another. They all have their drawbacks as well as their advantages. And the second thing, and again, this, this will be familiar to many of, many of you, is that this is kind of the stock, I guess I um, hesitate to use the word, but this is the stock neoliberal response, which is that the answer to any problem arguably caused or fermented by marketization is not less markets, it's more markets. It's not something other than markets, it's getting the market design right. It's optimizing markets rather than potentially moving away from market solutions. So that's the first answer, the answers in the market design. The second answer, which is the answer you hear from the industry, so from the renewables industry, which goes all the way from you know energy companies like Next Era Energy, all the way to the big asset managers like BlackRock and Global Infrastructure Partners and Brookfield, who are some of the biggest investors in renewables development um, today. And their answer, um, and again, this won't surprise you, is that we just need bigger subsidies. So the argument there is, yes, we have these subsidies. They've been there historically. But right now, the subsidies aren't big enough. We're only generating profits of 5 to 8% with subsidies at that level. If you want the investment to ramp up at the rates you say you need it to ramp up, then I'm sorry, you're going to have to increase those subsidies to boost the profitability. And essentially, that's what the Inflation Reduction Act was. On my reading, essentially, the government in the US had been attenuating the um, investment and production tax credits over time. They'd come down from the level, the original level they were at, which was 30 percent. They'd come down to 26, 24, 22, 20, 18 percent. You then had, um, not just in the US, but across the rest of the world, admittedly also, a problem with stagnating renewables investment. And the industry said, look, and I'm sure they said this explicitly as well as just implicitly, you're not going to get the investment you require with those tax credits at that level. And you're certainly not going to get it if you phase them out altogether. And so the government essentially said, OK, we need that investment to occur. So we'll just take it back to 30 percent. So that's the industry's answer, just more subsidy to, to essentially provide the, 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 the requisite level of profitability to call forth that investment. That's the second answer. The third answer, which is the, the answer essentially you get from, um, I, I would say, most on the left, is that public ownership has to be a significant part of the answer. And, I, and that's, I, I think, at any rate, I think um, that's the answer I'm most sympathetic to. My book is not um, an answer to the problem is it's, it's a di it's very much a diagnosis of the problem. It's 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 what will not save the world rather than what will save the world. Um, but I think that there's a lot of merit in the argument that look, if the private sector is still not doing what is needed, even though everywhere around the world there are still support me mechanisms in place, 
uh, extensive subsidies to renewables in every single country around the world. And even though the costs have come down to the extent they have, the private, if the private sector is still not delivering under those advantageous conditions, then maybe the private sector is not the answer in the first place. So those are the three different answers associated with, I guess, three different constituencies. What I would say, though, is what, what all of those answers share, of course, is that they're all essentially supply side answers. They all assume that, and I assume, I think the assumption is correct, that global electricity demand is going to increase into the future and is going to increase in many places substantially. Of course, the other answer would be on the demand side, which would be to say, which is essentially the kind of degrowth or post-growth answer, which is that the answer is not to assume that demand trajectory, but to dampen that trajectory um, purposefully and by design, in which case you have less need for investment and the profitability obstacle becomes less of a barrier or even arguably not a barrier at all. However, there are, you know, I personally have lots of thoughts about that, but the one that I want to mention here and the one I want to finish on by circling back to the question of, of regional geography around the world is that what does that mean for the global South? Now, and the reason I say that is that while, while people like myself working in Sweden, others working in Europe and, 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 other, and people working in North America like to think focus on our parts of the world a lot of the time the reality is that the main challenge in all of what i've been saying and indeed the main future impact in terms of decarbonization trajectories is not about what happens in north america and it's not about what happens in europe it's what happens in china and india and indonesia and nigeria and south africa and in a host of other countries, and for 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 three main reasons that I want to, or two main reasons I want to point out. So the first of those is that those continue to be the most fossil fuel intensive electricity generation sectors, and so the the so to speak the bang for the buck in terms of decarbonisation is commensurately greater there because they are currently the most fossil fuel intensive. The, that's where most work remains to be done. But the second and arguably even more important is that that's where future growth in electricity demand is expected to be concentrated as um, urbanisation, industrialisation, um, access to electricity proceeds apace. I mean, if you talk to, to people in many parts of the global south about the energy transition, they will, in my experience, often laugh in your face and say, well, we're just worried about energy access. Don't talk to us about energy transition. And so what happens in, in parts of the world that are very fossil fuel intensive still and where there is expected to be significant growth in electricity demand in the future is disproportionately important compared to what happens um, in, say, Sweden or the Netherlands or even uh, or even the US. I've gone on a little bit too long. I appreciate that. Um, but um I've done my level best to try and concentrate it into a very short space. Uh, so thank you to thank you for listening to me, and I'll be grateful for any questions or thoughts or objections or whatever else it might be. Okay, Brett, thank you so much. Um, I'm a huge fan of numbered lists, so this was a kind of utopian talk for me. Um, well, I think what we'll do is, folks on Zoom, if you want to type questions into the chat, I will get to those in a minute. In the meantime, maybe we can take three questions at a time, do one or two rounds from the, the room here. So uh, put up your hand. Anybody want to have a question or comment for Brett, Neil, Barrett, and anyone else? Okay, we'll start there. Uh, maybe just like say your name and kind of where you're coming from uh, and speak, really speak up, especially Barrett when it comes yeah. to Yeah, Neil, go ahead. Uh, Neil Flickstein from the sociology department. Speak can up. you hear me? You can't hear me if you can hear me. If you can hear me, okay, good, good. So, um, you know, the way you end this, uh, you know, the, the, the thing I come away from what all the things you're saying is there's a lot of different problems and a lot of different solutions for the different parts of the problem. And the one you really wanted to push on us today was the, the public ownership, which I totally get the logic of that. But at the end, you're talking about the global south. And, and I'm not sure there's a kind of big disconnect between um, 
what might happen here um, or and in the rest and in Europe and China, actually trying to fit your model, right? Because the Chinese government is public ownership and they're the most invested in, in uh, renewables. But I don't see how that fits the last point you're trying to make about, am I making sense? Yeah, okay. okay. Uh, my name is Tere Christofsson and I'm from uh, UIT, University of Tromsø. So I really enjoyed hearing your talk and especially what's happening in Europe now after uh, the invasion of Ukraine with electricity prices, uh, then this is the biggest controversy. And I live in a region with indigenous people, so we have a lot of discussions about this. And I think the experience from having a completely publicly owned hydropower sector to having one dominated by private wind, then ownership really comes into play. And I'm working on a few different case studies in Northern Norway. And I think, you know, with this kind of new discourse of a just and fair transition that's going to be happening very quickly, I think that's one of the quick ways to go, you know. So, for example, in Longyearbyen, which is in Svalbard, that's one of the sites I'm working at, there's a lot of support for renewable energy because they have a material ownership to it, but also like an immaterial ownership where they will actually profit from it, like, the local development and i think like with the depopulation and these things you know the local development is becoming the most important and then if you can have someone like we have this uh both grid companies and, and um, energy producing uh, companies that are in the hands of the municipalities and regions and the states then it's much easier to control that and i'm so i I think uh, it aligns with your argument, and I'm really looking forward to reading your book. So it's more common. Thank you. And I'm just going to add one question from the chat to this. Is public ownership proposed for the entire segment, both generation and such generation? Let's say generation and distribution. Okay. Um, so I, I'll just on the on the comment about Norway. I mean, Norway is I, I talk about Norway quite a lot actually in the book it's some of the a lot of the case studies i use in the book um are from norway and, and as I'm, and, and as you hinted that you were aware from your work it's a it's a really um interesting set of issues there not least because of the fact that so much of the wind development is concentrated in 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 regions where sami uh, livelihoods are very are very heavily concentrated and so it's a very again it's a very combustible set of issues in in Norway um and that I only kind of scraped the surface of the economic aspects of that in the book on the on the public ownership yeah I mean Neil your points your points very very well taken so one of the um one of the points I try to try to make in the book is that while I think it's clearly the case that um um a lot of the scaremongering about public deficits in places like the UK and various uh, uh, and, and various other rich countries in Europe, not to mention in North America, is scaremongering. It's also obviously the case, as you point out, that um, that sovereign governments in, in large parts of the global south operate under much more severe fiscal constraints than rich country governments do. Uh, and that their their fiscal wherewithal to undertake, you know, public borrowing, public investment and public ownership um, are not commensurate with those uh, with those in the global north, and I and I think that that's why um, um, amongst people that understand these issues, there's there's essentially a consensus now that you simply will not get an an energy transition in large parts of the global south unless unless it's financed by Western financial institutions, whether those are public and or private. It was really interesting to me that. You know, even the outgoing energy editor of the FT, um, I forget, I forget his name, but he 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 had been the energy 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 editor for a number of years, and he left that position just before Christmas. And in his kind of parting shot, he wrote this extraordinary piece where he basically said, "You know, it it, it baffles me, Mister Energy Editor, that that question of whether this needs to be financed by the West is still even open to question." To today because it, it you know it absolutely has to be the way, that way otherwise it's not going to happen so those those fiscal constraints are 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 severe and for sure that makes a huge difference in terms of the capacity for public ownership for the for these things and of course 
when it comes to private financing, the reality is that borrowing for a solar or wind farm in, say, Senegal means borrowing at, say, 12 or 13 percent, whereas in the UK or, or in the Netherlands, it might be five or five or six percent. And therefore, you do need development finance institutions to come to the table to reduce that cost of capital. So, yeah, ab- absolutely. On on the question of public ownership at different at, at different points of the supply chain, I think that I'm focusing specifically on generation, um, both in in what I've been saying today and um and certainly in the book itself but f- as far as i'm concerned the the um the argument for public ownership of of certainly of transmission is even stronger than it is for 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 generation um and it's you know you only have to start digging into electricity to find it completely baffling that transmission grids were ever privatized in the first place i mean there's literally as far as i can tell no coherent argument for that to occur in an in a natural monopoly where there's you know obvious an obvious public good being uh, delivered and 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 i think interestingly in those parts of the world where um where electricity assets that had been privatized have subse- subsequently been renationalized it is typically transmission and distribution resources because countries have rapidly realized the complete folly of privatizing those assets in the first place yeah thanks so much brett um my name is isaac i think quite a lot about public ownership both of the grid itself and then as you're speaking to the ownership of generation and i'm curious what your thoughts have been about this period that a friend of mine calls the mid-transition uh, where we are neither going to have 100% public ownership of all renewables, uh, nor are we going to have just zero. I mean, the success of activists in New York to win the Build Public Renewables Act puts them in a place where, in the near future, the state of New York will own some proportion of renewables that are being sold into uh, that market, that wholesale market. And so now you have a private, you know, a public actor in the private market. And I'm just curious of what you've thought about that uh, over that long haul that you uh, framed us up so well to think about. So thanks. Yeah. So hi, um, I'm Jonathan Guy. I'm a PhD candidate here at Berkeley. Um, yeah. Sorry. Um, so my, I, I guess I was wondering, do you know, of, like, is there any data on the relative profitability of renewables um, investment across like different jurisdictions? And if so, like, how might that, like looking at the sources of the, that variation or the correlates, give us clues about, um, you know, why renewables are less profitable? Um, and I, I guess I wasn't really clear, like, I could see three different reasons why they might be less profitable. One would be that, like, there's more uneven distribution of, like, fossil fuels and thus rents than renewables. Um, another would be, like, other barriers to entry, like, stemming from, like, capital, like, intensity requirements, which seem to be, like, in your journal article. And then the third would just be like policy differences, like governing sector. Um, is, is this right? Is, is one of these three or all of them like kind of part of your argument as to why renewables are less profitable? It, it wasn't totally clear to me um, because like obviously yeah. fossil fuel commodities could are, have very volatile, you know, um, price movements as well. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'll stop there. Uh, Andrew. Hi, uh, Andrew Yeager, uh, PhD candidate here as well. Uh, thanks, Brett. I, I really love the talk. Um, just a quick question on your um, your uh, sense of these other answers for how to solve this. And I'm specifically wanting to hear more of your critique of the sort of neoliberal response, or and maybe also of the sort of BlackRock response that we just need more subsidies to boost profitability here. I mean, do you think that's viable or, or is that sort of new subsidized industry also going to be eaten up by the same sort of, you know, as the profitability, they're also going to be eaten up by the same sort of dynamics that you identify? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, maybe I'll start, maybe I'll start with the last one. I mean, I hope, I hope I can do justice to all of them. It's, it's, it's quite late here and my brain's pretty frazzled. And so my ability to kind of take all of that in and then process it in an intelligible fashion is, is uh, it's not it's not great at the best of times, and it's getting even worse at this time in the evening. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, look, I mean, it's pretty under it's pretty easy to understand where the likes of BlackRock are coming from, right? I mean, they're 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 capitalist institutions, and they've been essentially tasked with doing something 
And they're like, look, the, the, if it's as things stand, it's not sufficiently in our interest to do that. So you guys, as in the state, had better come to the table and make it in our interest. And, you know, absent anything else happening to speed things along, I, you know, personally, if it comes to a choice between, and I, I wrote this, I, I, I put it in exactly this way in, in, a, in an opinion piece I wrote about this, if the choice is between, you know, on the one hand, the energy transition going as fast as we need it to and BlackRock making, you know, a shitload of money, or on the other hand, the energy transition not happening, but BlackRock not getting subsidized, I'd take the first alternative every day of the week, right? So like, I'm not, it, it's not a case of like cutting off your nose to spite your face. Like, you know, it's completely understandable to me why they say that. And I, and I, and I get it. Um, the, the problem, of course, is that we end we've ended up we are in this situation, which kind of says a lot about contemporary capitalism, where the private sector is essentially kind of able to hold the world to ransom um, if, if that's not putting it too um, too starkly. The, going back to the question, um, or at least to part of the question before that, um, yes, all of those factors um, play into this. Uh, question to one extent or another and I think that there are data although they're not they're not necessarily very good data on relative rates of profitability in 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 different markets what you tend to find um is that is that um the the periods of of good of strong profitability in in renewables not surprisingly tend to occur when new um government support mechanisms have been put in place um and industry actors are able to exploit those mechanisms before governments realize how generous they actually were and kind of correct correct for those mechanisms given the levels of profit and there's a, there's a famous case which I talk about in the book which is Spain around 2007 to 2011 where Spain introduced a whole raft of new feed-in tariffs that were that turned out to be, and obviously when you introduce those feed-in tariffs, which is to say a fixed price for electricity for solar and wind operators, those fixed prices are based upon a whole series of underlying assumptions about capital costs, about technology costs, about energy demand, other sources of electricity supply from other, and they got all of those assumptions wrong. And, and what that meant was that those tariffs turned out to be incredibly generous. So the industry made um huge profits over that period and then the government then retroactively cut those tariffs and ended up in a series of like decade-long lawsuits with those generators precisely because they had they had introduced those uh tariffs retroactively so a lot of the differences in profitability um between jurisdictions i as far as i can tell come down to the nature of the government support mechanisms and the ability of the industry uh, to ex to exploit those different mechanisms. The first question, remind me, I know that there was the first question, but it's completely slipped my mind. So please, the first question, remind me of that, of the first question, what yeah. that was. Brad, it was a little bit about like uh, publicly owned renewables being, you know. Ah, yes, so New York, build, build Public Renewables Act and um, the New York Power Authority. Yeah, so my view on that is that, um, is that, it's only in countries like the US and the UK, all existing um, plans and proposals and even um, actually existing enterprises for publicly owned renewables are so small and are set to remain so small that they will kind of represent mere gnats on the hide of the beast of private electricity generation and consumption, by which I mean that they will be public entities, but they will be operating within a market and an industry context where they don't set the rules, essentially. And so while they will be publicly owned, they will be required by the very nature of those industry contacts to act as if they were essentially as if they were privately owned entities in yeah. order to in order to subsist in that market. And here and here kind of my inspiration goes back to to uh to uh, Dory Massey um one of the great geographers who in the late 1970s she wrote these fantastic uh 
pieces on public ownership, not of energy, but of land. And she was kind of intervening in a set of debates about public act, public land ownership at the time where we still talked about things like public land ownership. And, and her basic point was that it's all very well arguing for public land ownership, but there's no point in having public landowners, and I would add public owners of energy, unless those entities are enabled and incentivized to act in a way that is fundamentally different from private owners. Because otherwise, there's no point in having public owners if you're simply expecting those entities um, implicitly or explicitly to behave in the same way as private actors. There's no point in having public ownership. And I think that's as true of energy as it is of land. Thank you. OK, Brett, we are taking so much of our time. We're only going to take five more minutes. <laughs> we'll that's fine. OK, so I'm going to, um, this has been so great. I'm going to summarize two questions from the chat and then I'm going to throw in mine, finally using okay. my moderate privilege. So from Renee, basically the question is, how much does it help if we limit the consumption of the richest and high income countries? And, you know, the figures on emissions and consumption are obviously there, but the social mechanisms. So anyways, how much does that help? A question from uh, Ben Bradlow, um, another great sociologist. Um, basically asking, well, right now interest rates are high, so that makes everything even worse for renewable developers. But what happens if central banks have a climate mandate that could make money cheaper? I don't know, either in general yep. or maybe for renewables. Then my yep. question is, um, I listen to a lot of these podcasts where they talk about market design, and it kind of reminds me a bit of this book called A Novel Red Plenty about the Soviet Union, which some of you might know, which is basically a history of the effort under um, Khrushchev to kind of do perfect planning with computers, but that the nomenclature opposed. But basically the question is, inside of the market design discussion, is there a kind of like inside out utopianism about planning? Because the, the way they talk about market design, the interventions needed become so specific and so complex that it just starts to look like the name for planning and the yeah. ownership isn't exactly there. But I wonder if that actually is the tunnel through that you go down that tunnel and at the end of the day, you just come to a more powerful and effective public sector, not to be taken yeah. for granted. I don't know yeah. how else one can ultimately read or see the kind of telos of that discussion. Um, yeah. So put those three to you, five minutes, anything you want to yeah. tell us. With, Absolutely. I'm going to start with the last one. I'm going to start with the last one because it was fresh. They were three fantastic questions like all the others were. I'll start with the last one. And then I'm going to ask you to remind me very briefly of the other two because I was concentrating so hard on each one. So the last one, I think that's absolutely true. And so the, th the, th the more you learn about electricity and the way in which it works, the more it becomes more or less impossible to think that the electricity markets that we actually have today are really markets in any significant shape or form. They are, as, as I can't remember who it was, but um, uh, someone in the US and ele an electricity um, um, market scholar basically designed it as a bureaucratic thicket. So, so much regulation and intervention needs to be put in place to remain the, to, to actually sustain the pretense that what you actually have there is a market that, um, that actually it, 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 it's so far from what we, we tend to think of. It's about the furthest, I've, the furthest I've ever come across from what in any shape or form you might normally think of as a market that um, it's just, it's, it's actually not even best thought of being, of, of as being a market. It's, it is a bureaucratic thicket is what it is that, put, that is put in place that serves to remain, to maintain the pretense that what you actually have is kind of, market actors behaving in a quote unquote free market environment. So I think that's completely true. It's entirely planned from start to finish. And it's and it's and it's essentially planned um when it comes to renewables, it's planned in such a way to try to sustain profitability at a level that that will continue to generate investment. So that was the that was the last one. The second question, which give me one word to remind me of the second question. The other two, the, the consumption of the richest and the other one yeah, is I'll... central banks, cheaper money for renewables. Yeah. So, cent so central banks. Absolutely. Um, so if you look at so China, again, China, Japan is also a very good example of this. But China, which I talk a lot about in the book for obvious reasons, because you have to. China is a hugely important example of this. So in 2020 or 2021, China essentially got rid of its feed-in tariffs, at least its central government feed-in tariffs, which were its main support mechanism for wind and solar. And lots of people said, oh, investment's going to collapse. 
But it hasn't. It obviously hasn't. And one of the main reasons it hasn't is that at the same time, a new support mechanism was which was put in place, which was central bank subsidization of credit. And so I can't remember what it's called. I think it's called the, cent, the uh, carbon emissions something facility, SURF, I think the acronym is, where basically the, the central bank doesn't lend directly to renewables developers, but it subsidizes the credit that is provided by by private and, and also publicly owned banks to renewables developers. And that is continuing to play a hugely significant role. So absolutely, central banks can do a huge amount to reduce the cost of capital, which in renewable space is incredibly important for all sorts of reasons I get into in the book. And in China and Japan, that's happening. It's not happening in, in other parts of the world, but it is happening there. And they are very good examples to, to uh, an analyze and learn from. Can um, or could um, in a kind of in a in a utopian world um, reduce consumption from the world's riches have a significant impact? I think it could. I absolutely it could. And you only have to you know I hate to say this, but you only have to look at um, relative electricity per capita consumption in the different regions of the world and the hor frankly horrific figures in the US to see that. Um, it could have an enormous impact. I mean, I thought we in Europe were bad, but US per capita electricity consumption is off the clock compared to almost any European country. It's extraordinary to behold when you look at those figures. And of course, it could have an enormous effect. But of course, politically, that's a whole other question. But I'm, you know, what I'm, you know, more broadly than just electricity, the last thing I am is someone who thinks that, who thinks that, you know, it's all about, you know, changing the production side of the question and that kind of indiv even individual consumption behaviours are irrelevant. I, I totally disagree with that argument. I think individual consumption and certainly so social consumption things matter very, very much precisely because they're dialectically interrelated to what goes on on the production side. So yes, is my answer to that. Thank you so much, Brett. Thank you also for ending with that, uh, I'm sure intentional, but subtle reference to Capital Volume 3 remarks describes consumption distribution and production is all dialectically interrelated. Um, anyway, thank you so much, Brett, for joining us late in the evening. Brilliant talk, an amazing example of like publicly engaged and accessible political economy and climate political economy that's landing, getting hugely discussed here, FT, NYT, many acronyms besides. So really inspirational work. Huge thanks to you for joining us. Thanks to everybody on Zoom for being a part of this. And thanks to you all for coming out here in person. Thanks, thanks for having me. me.